Hi, my name is Patrick Carruth, president and headmaster of the Bear Creek School. I'd like to welcome you to Tools for Success. Tools for Success is a partnership between the school and our parents to help you in raising your students. We do a lot in the building with education and you do a lot at home with education and raising your children. So we wanna partner with you in that. So thanks for joining us at Tools for Success. I hope the content that we provide you is useful for you um, as you raise up children in the way that they should go. I'd also like to encourage you to be on the lookout throughout the year for other events like Tools for Success put on by the Bear Creek School to partner with you to help your student become the individual God intends. Hi, good morning everyone and thank you for tool, for uh, attending Tools for Success Technology Through the Ages this morning. We are really excited to learn uh, from and alongside one another. We have an amazing lineup of speakers. My name is Katie Gamalkiewicz. I am an Assistant Director for Admissions at the Bear Creek School and this morning I will be your MC throughout the event and help guide you to all of the, the great content and great breakouts as well as presentation that we have have this morning. I'd love to open us in prayer and then I will uh, introduce our um, introductory speaker, Nathan Pettit. But first, let's pray together. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for the opportunity we have to come together as a community and have fellowship with one another and learn from one another um, about technology and how we can uh, partner well um, with all the devices and all of the access, um, both positive and also challenging that we receive through this. I pray that you would bless the speakers this morning, uh, give them wisdom and clarity of thought and word, and I pray that you would bless all of the parents that are here this morning, um, that we would be a resource to them and that uh, they can share alongside us in this parenting journey. Amen. Our keynote speaker this morning is Nathan Pettit. Nathan is a devoted husband and father who lives in Redmond with his wife and young children. As the early middle school and middle school dean of students, Nathan works with the faculty, staff, and students to develop, implement, and oversee programs, events, and activities that enhance faith, community, and character of students at the Bear Creek School. In addition to enjoying time with his family, Nathan loves to grab a cup of coffee and read books related to theology, psychology, technology, and historical fiction. He's also an avid college basketball fan, Rock Chalk Jayhawk. He holds a BA in Biblical Languages from Northland International University and an MA in Biblical Studies from Northland International University and an MA in Biblical Exegesis from Wheaton College. We are honored to have Nathan with us this morning and I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, Katie, um, for that kind introduction and uh, just this wonderful opportunity to address a topic that I care so deeply about. Parents, I consider it such a privilege to have this time with you. And for those of you who send your children to Bear Creek, um, just to partner with you in helping your children become people of wisdom, compassion, and courage. As we journey through these years together, um, with that goal in mind, there are fewer topics that require as much att um, discussion, attention, um, intention um, than navigating our use of digital technology. And while um, this presentation is very one directional, please reach out if you would like to make it more of a conversation and dive deeper into anything that's presented today. And um, just, just to be really honest about where I'm going, since our breakout rooms um, will be highly practical, um, which, which is super important to get very practical with our use of technology. I want to use some of this time to explore some more high level questions like what do the scriptures say about the purpose of technology? How do we cultivate habits of, of mind, body and spirit that enable us to lead a tech wise and abundant life? And what does technology actually do? Um, why are people so concerned about it? And so if we start there, um, surely one of the reasons and, and Katie alluded to this, um, that we have questions and concerns about technology is, due, is just due to the growing frequency and ubiquity um, with which our screens have come to um, dominate our homes, our work, and our time. Uh, the, honor, the author Annie Dillard wrote, how we spend our days is of course how we spend our lives. And increasingly it seems that we are spending our days and our lives on screens. 
Um, just over a generation ago, there really wasn't much of a web to surf, but today most working parents and many teens and tweens um, are spending more than half of their waking hours online. And as we know, how we spend our time and where we invest our attention has a major effect and, and influence on the kind of people that we're becoming. Um, and some of those effects and are really, really good and others uh, just maybe unforeseen and, and some really unwanted as well. Um, so truthfully, I think that in many ways, digital technology is a lot like an iceberg. So hear me out. What we observe at the surface grabs our attention and sometimes our concern, things like screen time, privacy, digital footprint, effects of social media and so forth. But interestingly, 90% of an iceberg lies below the surface of the water, hidden from our sight. So to truly navigate technology well, we need to understand what's happening in areas we can't see with our eyes. We need to go a little bit deeper. So let's jump in by starting with the scriptures and seeing what they have to say about the purpose of technology. In the opening chapter of Genesis, as God is creating the universe, he gives his creations a purpose and a function. To the stars, he gives the job of separating day and night and marking out the seasons. To the plants, he gives the job of sprouting fruit and seed. To the fish, which literally in the Hebrew um, means swimming things, God says swim. And to the birds, literally flying things, God says fly. What they are made to do, shining, sprouting, swimming, and flying, in part defines what they are. And then on the sixth day, God creates human beings, and he says, let us make humankind in our image. This means that part of our job and the essence of really what it means to be human is to bear God's image for the rest of his creation. And um, Genesis expands on that idea of, of image bearing as well. God commands humans to have dominion and subdue the earth in Genesis 1, and to cultivate and keep the garden in Genesis 2. And there's an important takeaway there that I think we need to key in on. God did not design the garden um, or the world to remain as it was. It needed work, it needed to be cultivated. Um, and humans were charged with that, with that work, with that cultivation and working process to unpack and extend its limits, bringing the goodness and blessing and love of God to every inch of the world. And when we cultivate the garden, and, and that is really when we unpack, unfurl and expand upon God's created world, we are reflecting his image. And accomplishing that mission requires something that the ancient Greeks referred to as techne, known literally as art, skill, or craftsmanship. And of course, it's where we get our word technology from. One Greek philosopher who actually lived 400 years before Christ gave examples of techne by naming skills like uh, military arts, painting, sculpting, cooking, medicine, architecture, mathematics, and other skills um, like those. And ancient technique continues today um, when we do things like carve out stone into a cathedral, dress a turkey to feed a hungry family, treat the sick and destitute in our midst with medicine and, and treatment and whatnot. These are all wonderful examples of bearing God's image well and expanding the goodness of his created world. However, those are not the activities that come to our mind when we think of technology usually, right? Um, so if we time hop uh, from from 400 years before Christ all the way to the 1600s, we find the time that technology appeared into the English language. And its usage expanded you know, greatly, especially during the Industrial Revolution in the 17 and 1800s. And as machines grew larger, more powerful and ubiquitous, um, people started to distinguish between the fine arts like painting, sculpting, from the mechanical arts of machine making and operating. And so going, just jumping right to today, um, I think this is really helpful. Nicholas Carr, in his best-selling book, The Shallows, presents four categories for our modern technologies. Um, one set extends, extends our physical strength, dexterity, or resilience. Um, so you think of things like the plow, the darning needle, the airplane, and so forth. The second set extends the range or sensitivity of our senses. So we think of things like the microscope or the amplifier. The third set enables us to reshape nature to better serve our needs or desires. So again, we think of things like medicinal tablets. I took some Tylenol yesterday, which was really helpful, um, or genetically modified corn plants and whatnot. And then a final set, and this is really what we wanna key in on today, includes all the tools we use to extend or support our mental faculties, to find and classify information, 
to formulate and articulate ideas, to share knowledge, to take measurements and perform calculations. So we think of all these kinds of things like the abacus, the sextant, the book, the globe, the calculator, uh, the computer, and the iPhone. And CART calls these intellectual technologies, um, and most of our digital screen-based technologies really fall under this category. So now, if you're listening in, um, I'm guessing that you didn't join to hear me discuss how to wield a plow or genetically modify corn, and that's good because I would be of little help um, on both accounts. While I do want to shift our focus now toward digital technology specifically, I just really wanted to do so within the broader context of just what I've just presented that any technology is at best a tool in our hands to unfurl the potential of God's creation and extend his goodness and grace to the ends of the earth. And that to wield any tool well, be it digital or not, takes this ancient vision of techne. It takes art, it takes skill, it takes craftsmanship, um, and not to mention a heavy dose of wisdom and discernment. The task before us presents a lot of challenges. Um, and even if we go back to Genesis, um, even as Adam and Eve depart from the garden in the, in the Genesis narrative, they're warned of this very fact. The ground produces thorns and thistles, and cultivating it will involve toil and struggle sometimes. And it turns out that both the technology we use and the aims we have for, it, for them can be fraught and fractured, capable of doing great good on the one hand, and on the other, harm to ourselves, to those we love and to society at large. So let's take a step back and ask, what have we learned as we survey technology through the ages? What do theology and history and science and psychology have to say about the forces of technology? And in particular, the more recent and all-encompassing rise of digital technology. I wanna present three lessons I think we've learned and, and I hope that these kind of build upon one another. And I'd like to explain the first by making a personal confession. In stark contrast to my lovely wife, I have no sense of direction. When I step outside, it is very difficult, often nearly impossible for me to discern north, south, east, or west. And most of my closest relationships throughout life are marred with at least one story of me um, getting lost somewhere or taking far too many wrong turns. Um, ask me sometime about my first date with my wife you know, there was some hiccups. And yet, if there were ever a time when I began seeing some progress, it was soon after I received my driver's license. And this is the first time I'm publicly using this phrase. Back in my day, if you were going somewhere, you relied either on someone's written instructions, helpful, or my personal preference, um, a step-by-step -step directions from a website called MapQuest. And after entering with MapQuest, I could enter my beginning and ending locations, and I printed my instructions and I'm off. MapQuest got me where I needed to go, um, but I still struggled from time to time, um, particularly after missing an exit or a turn, then you kind of have to read the directions backwards. But even those challenges really helped me to get more of a sense of learning. And, um, you know, again, just, I really didn't have great excuses because I grew up in Kansas, which is one of the most perpendicular places you could ever come to. I wasn't even dealing with the windy roads of, of the Pacific Northwest. A lot changed, however, when I got my first iPhone in college, um, which was equipped with an app called Maps. And Maps, immediately when I put in my location or my, my route, my destination, it charted my route, it set me on my path, it even vocalized my directions um, if desired. Um, and even after missing a turn, recalibrated to make me still feel like I was going the right way, um, which was always north, you know, mind you, the way it looks on the app. And unfortunately, any progress I was beginning to make in developing a sense of being in the world, um, and more specifically, a sense of being on the road before getting an iPhone was, was really kind of swiftly undone. Though, of course, I never really got lost with my Maps app, which was helpful, and I'm sure I saved an extraordinary amount of time and gas money because of it as well. But here's the reason I tell the story about my phone and the Maps app. I was doing something with my phone. I was doing something with that app, but it was also doing something to me. Um, and this leads to just the first um, idea, that's, which is already um, up there on the PowerPoint. And that's technology, digital or otherwise, is not neutral. It transforms us. I think we like to think of any tool, again, call it digital or otherwise, as something that's just inert, 
neutral that we can either use for good or bad purposes. Um, and that's just not the case. Um, and in a sense, technology really sits between us and the world, changing and molding both at once. And let's take something really simple like a shovel, for example. The earth feels the spade, but we feel the handle. We use the tool to dig at the ground, but in another sense, the ground uses the tool to chafe at our hands. The shovel connects us to the earth, but it also functions as a barrier, insulating us from directly touching the soil. Our primary connection then is with the tool, not the creation itself, giving the tool the opportunity to simultaneously shape both the world and its user. As media scholar John Culkin has said, uh, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. And this is again, just to be really clear, um, when it comes to digital technology, I think we tend to focus a lot on the content. Well, what's happening with that screen? What's happening with that kind of activity? But the point here is that the medium is actually often more important than the message. In other words, technology transforms someone regardless of why that person is using a tool. One person might use a shovel to break ground on a new orphanage, while another might use it to break car windshields. Clearly, obviously, one is morally superior to the other, but moral intent does not change the fact that both people end up with blisters and aching backs. Now, and this is, I think, part of the challenge, technology won't give us blisters. Um, it impacts things that we can't see as well, right? Like our brains, which as I'm sure most of you know, are highly plastic. Um, our neurons are always breaking old connections and forming new ones, and brand new nerve cells are constantly being created. So when we participate in practices from learning to juggle to surfing YouTube, our brains are learning new ways of thinking and processing. Specifically, when you pair uh, you know, our highly plastic, plastic brains with devices that have bright lights and moving pictures and dopamine infused reward systems, you create an environment just highly conducive for brain change. And um, back when we started measuring these types of things, one of the earlier studies um, on the internet's effects back in 2009 found really clear brain changes occurred in their subjects just from an hour a day of surfing the web. And obviously our, you know, our internet usage has only gone up since so again, just the big point here, technology, digital or otherwise, isn't neutral. It transforms us. So just three questions um, to reflect on, uh, maybe for you all at home, for me, I need to continue thinking about these. Um, asking ourselves things like, what message is the medium communicating? What's the medium telling me about my life, my being in the world? What habit is the medium reinforcing? And what is the medium replacing? So if we just take my Maps app, you know, for example, um, the Maps app is communicating some good things to me, like you're not lost, um, everything's okay, you know, calm down when you miss that turn. Um, it's, it's reinforcing a habit that, you know, really of dependency in a lot of ways that I don't need to necessarily know north, south, east, and west. Um, it's, it's, it's creating some dependency on that phone. Um, and then it's replacing some things as well, which for me, you know, at least with my story, it replaced my printed instructions. Um, so there were some really clear positive um, and negative effects, um, but at the same, but at that time, you know, I didn't have the wherewithal to really notice them. Um, and I think just in thinking about these types of things, it's important just to note: anytime we take a step toward technology, we're taking away a step away from something else, and that might be the right step to take. You know, I don't, I don't regret using the Maps app on my iPhone, but it's at least important to have that awareness that I was taking a step away from really kind of developing a sense of being in this world, which I do think is important for our you know, humanity. So um, that's our first point. I want to get even a little bit broader now, and I want to start with another story. I can still see um, the view in my mind's eye um, as clearly as it occurred today. I'm on the 542 bus route from Seattle to UW, taking a summer class one morning um, on a bus packed full of people on their morning commute. Uh, the sky was just so clear and so blue, not a cloud around. And as we were coming through the first tunnel, um, I felt the anticipation in my stomach. Again, remi remi reminder, I didn't grow up here. So just the ecstasy, the ecstasy of looking southeast. And yes, I actually had to pull up a map to see that it was southeast um, to, based on the direction I was going to find Mount Rainier southeast, um, towering above me in all its glory. I was looking forward to that. 
and we came through and and as I beheld it, I just remember really distinctly feeling um, this notion of just the grandeur of God that Gerard Manley Hopkins wrote in his famous poem. And so seconds later, you know, I'm having this moment and seconds later, I look around the bus just to share that moment with the people around me. But I found no one, not a single person awake to the mountain's glory. Instead, I found this. Uh, you know, among every single person. And what felt clear to me um, in that moment was that our phones weren't merely transforming each individual person on that bus. They were really dictating the bus's environment and atmosphere, its culture. So I believe it's important to note, secondly, that when we use technological tools, again, they could be digital or otherwise, to create cultural goods, um, because that technology is itself an element of culture, it too mediates a set of values, meaning, and identity back to us and to our broader culture. Um, and as another just case study, um, take a step back with me and picture life uh, before the mechanical clock. Again, a great invention. I'm glad that we can tell time the way we do today. But if we go back in time, um, when the average lifestyle was dominated by just rhythms of agriculture or farming, uh, free of haste, unconcerned by um, you know, tethering productivity necessarily to time-based tasks um, until um, initially in the 6th century, St. Benedict ordered his followers um, in his monastery to hold seven prayer services at specified times during the day. And then 600 years later, um, a sister branch of a Benedictine style of, of monks, the Cistercians, um, divided the day into just even a more regimented sequence of events and activities, and they really expect, expected punctuality as well um, from the people, from those monks. And spurred by that need, it was really some monks who took um, the lead in pushing forward um, some of the first technologies of timekeeping and assembled some of the first mechanical clocks. And then later in Europe, as people moved from the countryside to the town and started working in markets, mills, and factories, their days became carved um, into ever more finely sliced segments, each announced by the tolling of a bell. So the start, the, the sound started for the start of work, um, meal breaks at work, uh, the end of work, the closing of the gates, the start of um, the market, emergencies, council meetings, curfew, and so on. And the need for tighter scheduling and synchronization of work um, and transportation and even leisure, you know, at some level uh, provided the impetus for this rapid progress in clock technology. So much so that by the 14th century, the mechanical clock had really become commonplace. And in 1504, the first rich wristwatch was assembled. And if just the pro proliferation of public clocks, um, just they changed the way that people worked, shopped, played, behaved, um, and, and, and that just was continued by the spread of pocket watches and, and wrist watches, um, and they continue to have just more significant effects. And so Nicholas Cargan, I'll cite him, he writes um, that by continually reminding its owner of things like time used, time spent, time wasted, time lost, um, the clock became both prod and key to personal achievement and productivity. The mechanical clock changed the way we saw ourselves. It changed the way we thought, um, playing a crucial role in propelling, propelling us out of the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment. So as you trace technological advancement, this theme really arises that while we are all you know, free to choose how we'll use tools um, and the technology around us, those tools, that technology themselves are, or, are oriented toward a particular set of uses and those uses emerge when a large number, number of people use them. So much so that social and societal changes occur and often in a manner hardly predicted by its inventors. Um, and let's just go right back to cell phones. You know, when the first cell phones came on the market, nobody pictured a bus full of people silently, you know, closed off to the world. Um, most people bought them for emergencies or business. Yet as cell phones have expanded to include just so many more uses and, and they, you know, gain more and more features beyond making calls, um, there's, there, there are built-in tendencies um, involved there. So I want to share this um, idea. Marshall McLuhan offered us what he called um, a tetrad, which is really just 
a fancy name for a group or set of four, um, for understanding how technolo technological tendencies emerge and play out within a culture. So the first is that, and, and you can all do this with the phone, but I'd encourage you, you know, as you're kind of evaluating or navigating certain tools or, you know, again, technology or otherwise, um, or digital or otherwise in your home, maybe try to walk through with this. It could be a fun activity for your family even. So one, they extend or magnify something that we do naturally. So take a phone, for example, it extends our ability to communicate and, and it really enhances our sense of personal identity. Second, um, tools um, eliminate or amputate something that we used to do. So before cell phones came on the market, we had landlines. We probably, you know, wrote a lot more letters or, or used snail mail um, when, when now it was just so much easier to call one another. So it eradicated that, it eradicated um, one's ability to be unreachable or alone as well. Third, they retrieve something from the past I think this one is kind of interesting um, where I went with this is just cell phones retrieve and increase frequency and familiarity that people were accustomed to um, when we when people lived in small towns or villages. You, know, you think of those um, those old you know shows or, or books that you've read where people go to the market and you're always running into a neighbor or somebody that you know carrying a phone with us all the time kind of bring some of that back that I can always be in touch with people who are familiar to me. And then lastly, Every technology has the possibility of reversing into a more negative behavior when it's overused. So when cell phones are overused, you know, our connections with others and therefore our relationships um, stay more on the surface. They just don't go as deep. And just one data point that I think was um, taken before the Apple Watch even came out, um, the, the surveys reported that 89% of Americans said that they had interrupted their last social interaction um, to turn to their phones. And I'm sure you've all been there, you know, when you're talking to somebody and, and I'm sure we're all guilty of it as well. And you feel, you hear the ding or you feel the buzz in your pocket and you just go to check and see what's happening. And 82% of those 89%, you know, people also said that the conversation suffered because they were distracted by their phone. And again, I just think about, again, no, no diss to the Apple Watch, but just even how much easier it is now just to glance and see what's happening in the world outside of you know what's right in front of us so when we're when we're so entrenched in the world of our phones we forget just the people who are nearby and um andy crouch again really helpful just within culture the culture making world and he has a lot of you know good stuff about technology as well in the family and in the home he offers um, some reflection questions to help us evaluate technology's effect on culture so um, there's three. One, he asks um, to finish the sentence, or, or how does how does the how does your digital technology finish the sentence? Now you can. How does your digital technology finish the sentence? You no longer have to. And how does your de your digital technology finish the sentence? Now you must. And that's where I want to go um, with just the the last point here is that technology and particularly newer digital technology um, often, often, not always, but often wants something from us. And of course, people have always wanted things from us. Uh, believe it or not, I recall the days when the door-to-door -door vacuum salesman stopped by and, um, you know, sorry, mom, if you end up watching this, but that's probably because my mom bought one. So I think that's why that memory kind of stands out. It wasn't just a quick knock at the door. He showed us, you know, all the different kind of vacuums and, and she kept one. Um, or we had the Schwan man, as we called him, often stopped by with frozen goods. And while the tone, the message, and the expectations varied on what the latest item could help you do or um, save you time from doing, the salesman al always wanted the same thing, which was um, money or, you know, purchase. Yet so much of our digital media now comes free of charge. And I think it's important to ask why. The funds are coming from somewhere else. Um, and to earn those funds, co companies need different resources from us. If they don't need our money, they need something else. And I want to highlight two. Um, and those are specifically our attention and um, a specific mentality, which I'll get to in a moment. So technology wants our time and our attention for sure. Um, but if there's an interesting paradox here, um, as well, I, I want to acknowledge um, it's that our our screens tend to scatter our attention even while they capture it. 
and I and those go together, right? And if you, you know, for the parents here, you think about just your workflow when your email is up or different things are happening. Um, your attention is is wrapped up in what you're doing, but it's also not deeply directed in one specific area unless you're intentional about closing some of those other applications. Internet users actually spend an average of 45 seconds on a website, and I, I think that's really about websites, not even a web page, scanning or skimming for the information relevant to them. And then so again, just part of when we think about the effects, um, just of losing touch with the patience and skill for deep reading, um, slow and steady processing, and wrestling with and digesting important ideas. Um, again, going back to Carr and his book, The Shallows, he presented uh, just a way of thinking about how we learn and how our memories work and thinking about moot transferring ideas from our short-term active memory into our long-term memory is kind of like taking a thimble under a faucet and filling up a cup. And when we're reading, when we're when we're doing things that are that don't involve any other kinds of distractions, that water is a steady stream. We can fill it up and move it pretty efficiently um, and uh, and util utility, you know, wise. But what happens when what we're reading is charged with like hyperlinks or ads or we're getting alerts and, and different things are coming up um, is that the water comes out in spurts and it's difficult to transfer as much into our long term memory um, for that reason. And that actually can happen even if we recognize it or not. So even if even if we're doing something, you know, that feels more focused, if there are hyperlinks around or buttons to choose from or alerts that are coming up, even if we're choosing to ignore them, our brains are still beneath our subconscious. That's occupying space that we have to make those even su even subconscious choices not to click or choose those things. So, so much of our online entertainment, social media, and even screen based um, learning environments deliver just a lot of sensory and cognitive stimuli, um, repetitive, intensive, interactive, you know, that have been shown to capture and hold our attention. I've shared about this before. Um, in past presentations, but I'm acknowledging publicly I have a mild addiction to fantasy football and um, no doubt there's some good sides of it. You know, for me, a lot of pleasure derives from the competition side of things. Um, I'm a competitive person um, and it's really fun to compete with friends and colleagues and to participate with them. Those are all really wonderful benefits. Um, but at the end of the day, the thrill doesn't actually come from wins and losses. Um, for me at least, and I think for hundreds of thousands of other people, um, the thrill and some of the addictive power um, comes during the football games um, themselves. When each glance at my phone or at my computer uh, becomes akin to really like the dopamine rush that people get from pulling a slot machine as you check on your player scores and see, did they score? Did they not? Did my quarterback throw an interception? There's always and the same things, you know, are, are studied about social media as people check on likes or snaps that are coming in or different things like that. Anytime there's a question of, um, you know, what's going to happen next and there's that that reward system kicks in, it, it draws us back in again and again. And Yahoo, you know, it's free for me to play fantasy football. It doesn't pull hundreds of thousands of people to play without, you know, that kind of access, that kind of um, access to the to keeping our attention to impulsive checking consistency and whatnot. Um, and the reality is, is that those companies don't make money from us if they don't have our attention, so they need it, you know, at some level. The second resource um, digital technology needs from us. I don't know that it's talked about a whole lot. Um, it's a certain kind of mentality an expectation that our technology often promises us, and that is a burdenless frictionless kind of easy everywhere life. Uh, my wife and I have been reading, this is my first time through probably her third or fourth or whatever. Um, we've been reading through the Little House on the Prairie um, series to our boys in the evenings before bed. And last night we actually just finished book number two um, called Farmer Boy. And I read, so I probably read half of it. She read about half of it um, just based on what's happening each evening. And I just was so struck. I mean, just every night with again and again, just how different life was. 150 years ago, how not easy everywhere, you know, their life was. Um, some of the more recent chapters I read was just the harvest process that this family had and all their land and everything that had to be done, the jobs that sometimes went, you know, into the night and waking up early in the morning. So I think of things like and things that, um, you know, some of the main characters had to do, um, you know, we once had to tend a fire if we wanted to stay warm. 
and now we switch a thermostat. Again, I'm not advocating that we go back in time. I'm just, I think it's important to acknowledge some of these things. Um, we once had to make our own candles. Now we flip light switches. We once harvested our own food. Now we fill shopping carts and we could go on and on. Again, I think another um, maybe side note, another paradox here is that so much of, I think what technology um, wants us to believe and, and really tries to solve truthfully is um, making things take less time. But again, I think the paradox is that while we're not doing all of these activities that we had to do years and years ago, we often feel like we have less time than we've ever had. We feel so busy all the time, even as our life is so easy. So Andy Crouch says, um, most technology thinks that, you know, you should make that easy choice whenever you have it. Reduce friction, reduce burdens, um, and to think that it'll be good for you, your household, your quality of life. And another example he goes to is how should, you know, we communicate um, what matters with the people around us? And he says, you know, we're going to make it so, social media says we're going to make it so low friction to disseminate your thoughts, your ideas, the pictures of your puppy, and it'll make it so easy to connect um, with others and maybe even achieve fame. And just think about before social media, you know, we once had to sit with someone in their sorrow or sit with them in their joy and respond to them in real time. And now it's just so frictionless, like clicking a like button or even, you know, now we have that opportunity to do that on um, via text. And again, it's not all bad, um, but the more we use social media like a device um, that just effortly, effortlessly amplifies our presence and message in the world, the less I think productive it is or, or, or formational it is. And that, that's because easy doesn't form, change or shape us, right? In the end, when our lives are easy, we don't have much to offer one another because we're not growing into more wise, compassionate, courageous people. So as we wrap up today um, or, or my time this morning, I'm sure I haven't said this enough, um, I'm so grateful for so much um, digital and mechanical technology. I'm thankful for modern medicine. Um, I'm amazed that clean water wells can be quickly and efficiently installed in third world countries. Um, I'm grateful for instruments that project pictures of babies in the womb. I'm really thankful, last night I was thankful for this, that I can order food ahead on my iPhone rather than stand in line for 20 minutes with my squirmy little children. Um, you know, my my hope here was not to characterize all digital technology as um, deformational, but to just tune us in. I think this is really important to tune us into the effects of our tech, specifically that we can't see or always perceive as well, and to utilize them in a way that honors that concept of ancient techne, developing the skill, art, using technology like a craftsman, like a craftsman um, that's necessary to bear God's image for his glory and to extend his goodness in the world. And so you see these on the on the screen. I just want to three ideas to start working your way toward um, ancient techne is this. Um, one is just to practice solitude. Um, we don't have much to offer God or really our neighbor if we can't sit alone with our thoughts, emotions, hopes and fears. Um, if you're not sure where to start, I'd recommend just putting screens away in the car during meals and at least an hour before bed. Fostering wonder, I think, is really important. Get outside, memorize poetry, read deeply, ponder questions without looking them up on the internet. Um, my wife and I actually make a point to take occasional meal times to ask our children what they're wondering about. Not so that we can answer their wonders, but so that we can participate with them, to pause and wonder with them to nurture within them the true reality that this world is charged with mystery, beauty, and God's grandeur. And then lastly, uh, plant a garden or don't. <laughs> and my point here there is do something that connects you to the earth. Learn how to build a fire, um, make a rope swing on a, on a tree, um, pull some weeds. One of my favorite um, traditions we have in Bear Creek Middle School is that we go to Sambika for one of our annual field trips to serve on their grounds for a few hours in the morning. And our last trip was two years ago, you know, pre-COVID. And I still just vividly remember observing the thrill that many students had from using a wheelbarrow for the first time or making a rock path, planting grass seed, and just the joy that came from serving together and fulfilling that image bearing responsibility to cultivate the earth, to extend God's goodness with our hands. And so to end our time, um, I've mentioned this poem, I think two or three times. I wanna recite, I'll try to do it from memory. Um, just the grandeur of God by Gerard Manley Hopkins. I think that the um, poem specifically is, is super applicable because he wrote it um, during, with, with the industrial revolution in mind and grappling with um, a world that once felt so charged with mystery and wonder and beauty and started to feel more closed off 
to God's role. And so here it is, um, just again in closing. Um, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last light off the black west went, O oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. May we sense the nearness of God's spirit, behold his grandeur, and do the good work of developing and utilizing technology for our good and for his glory. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan. That was uh, so inspiring. And every time I listen to you talk about technology, I learn something new. And I loved hearing uh, so many of your examples and thoughts, but especially I resonated with not being good with directions and, and the good of MapQuest um, and then maps, but also the impact that that has on us. So thank you for, for taking time this morning to share with us and really set the foundation for what's to come in the breakout session. So we posted an announcement in the, the chat and we realized that the uh, hyperlinks aren't working yet. So don't worry, we're working on that. We'll make sure that you uh, get those hyperlinks here in a minute. Um, but that is where you'll want to go to find your breakout room. So on the chat on the side of your screen um, there will be an announcement coming through if it hasn't already um, with your with your breakout room links uh, so there are three amazing breakout rooms you can't go wrong um, the first breakout room is going to be on the nitty-gritty of uh, technology and uh, you are welcome to attend any breakout room that you want. So please feel free to click into the one that resonates with you. Uh, but I want to give a little recommendation if you're not sure where to go. So the nitty gritty of technology uh, led by Linda Graham is really going to look at some of those specifics of uh, parental controls, of managing technology in the home, of looking at um, how you partner with your kids um, in this technological journey as they have devices. So if your kid actively has a device that's theirs and you want to learn how to manage that with them, that would be a great room to head into. Uh, our second breakout room is technology and technology free family fun led by uh, Kara and Amanda. And this breakout room is a, a getting lots of practical ideas and tips for how you can engage technology as a family, but how you can also step away from technology as a family. Um, that that is great, particularly for our younger parents um, who might be interested in learning how to sort of enter this world of technology with their kids, but still keep activities outside as well. And then the final breakout room led by Nathan, who you just heard from, as well as our upper school dean of students, Kevin Davison, is building friendships in a digital age. And this is a great breakout room for those that are, um, if we have students on the call, uh, as well as for parents that are looking at how to guide their children on, on forging strong friendships um, in the midst of this technological world. So like I said, any breakout room will be good for any family, but that's a little bit of guidance if you're trying to think about where to go. Please head to the breakout rooms in one minute. Um, those should be coming through now. We've got the links working in our announcements, but before you do so, I want to share with you that after the breakout rooms end, we will have a time uh, to talk through the admissions process at the Bear Creek School. So many of you on the call are current families, but we also have prospective families who are joining us this morning. Welcome. We're excited to have you here. So um, in your breakout room chat, there will be a link at the end of the time um, to click on if you'd like to learn more about the Bear Creek School and the admissions process. I'll be there. I would love to interact with you. I'm sure I've met some of you already and I'd love to meet some new faces as well. So 
if that applies to you, then um, please enter a breakout room, enjoy your time there. And then at the end, like I said, you'll see in that breakout room chat, uh, I'll post a link to that time. And um, once that ends, just follow that link and uh, and then we'll chat about the Bear Creek School. But before any of that happens, um, please uh, click on the side. Um, those links should be posted now and through to you. Um, and we'd love to have you uh, join those breakout rooms and learn, like Nathan said, really practical uh, tips and techniques for parenting um, and technology through the ages. So um, I'll hang out here while you all pick your breakout room, um, but please feel free to, to hit those links and uh, go on in and hope you have a wonderful rest of the morning uh, with our amazing presenters there. I see a lot of you heading into those breakout rooms, so that's awesome to see. Um, again, you'll want to uh, go to the sidebar where it says uh, Q&A or chat, and then you'll want to hit one of those three breakout room buttons so that you can enter there. Someone asked a great question. Can we see more than one breakout room? Um, I would encourage you to stick with one breakout room for now. However, um, you are also, um, we will record the breakout rooms and so we should be sending um, out that additional information. All right, I'm going to sign off here so that you all can get into your breakout rooms. Um, so have a great rest of your morning and I'll pop in and out so uh, you'll see me there and then maybe in the admissions portion as well. Really what we want to try to do with this time is um, just walk the tightrope of not being extremist on either side, you know, and saying that in, in communicating that technology doesn't have any role in our kids' friendships, um, you know, not wanting to communicate that, but also not wanting to communicate, you know, give your kid, kid an iPhone at eight because everyone's doing it and that's how they're going to make friendships these days. But so what is it? We'll really try, and I think it's, it has to be nuanced, it can't be black and white, but to really walk that tightrope of considering um, what's developmentally appropriate. And, um, you know, Kevin has a lot more of that experience than I do because his kids are older. Um, I'm kind of still in the, the parent phase of just the less screens, the better, you know, for my littles. Um, but so, yeah, we'll jump into it. So I'll just say a couple obvious things and then I'll turn it over to Kevin. Um, one is just um, that, that there is so much formative power in face-to-face -face conversation as we think about um, what, what you know, as, as we think about kind of the end goal or, or just the, the reality that one day our kids, you know, will have phones, they'll be navigating friendships um, in a digital way. To do that well, you know, really requires a foundation of, of knowing how to navigate conversations in person, how to read somebody's face, you know, when you say something that might have been offensive or awkward or or whatever. We we don't. It's hard to learn those things through a text message or through a chat. It's a lot easier, obviously, to learn those things um, in person and to work that out together. Uh, so, one book that's just been really inspiring and helpful for me is um, Reclaiming Conversation: The Power of a Digital Age by Sherry Turkle. Um, so this is a quote from her: Face-to-face -face conversation is the most human and humanizing thing that we do. Fully present to one another, we learn to listen. It's where we develop the capacity for empathy. It's where we experience the joy of being heard and of being understood. And conversation advances self-reflection, the conversations with ourselves that are the cornerstone of early development and continue throughout our life. And you think about, again, just the contrast of like a, a text message is um, bi-directional, you know, in the sense that, that I send something to you and I'm over here not watching you read my text, not watching your responses, and then you send something to me. Whereas an in-person conversation, just completely immersive. You know, you have to work through awkward silences. And and Sherry Turkle actually says that um, it often takes. She thinks it often takes seven minutes for a conversation to go deep, and that in some of those seven minutes, you have to endure and work through some awkwardness um, before it gets to that place. Um, and I think, you know, for most of us who have kind of a, a sensitivity to awkward conversations, we want to bail, you know, before it gets to that point. Uh, so what are some barriers to in-person conversation? Um, Cal Newport is somebody that 
Um, again, I've just, I've appreciated, he has a couple books that I like, but the one that this quote is from is called Digital Minimalism. He says, you know, just in wondering why do we find ourselves bored sometimes in in-person conversation, he says it might be because we've just become so accustomed to a constant feed, right? That sometimes our, when our tech is immersive, what it brings, the connection, the information, the entertainment, and our brains, bodies, and hearts just learn to crave it. So in-person conversations move much more slowly. Um, they take time. Again, they, they take a lot of attention, a different kind of attention, I think, than um, our screens sometimes take. And again, just to be explicit, I don't mean to indicate that we should throw away our phones um, um, at all. Uh, you know, I, I just um, I just think it's important to, for us to be in tune with the people who are in front of us. And I have shared stories about this in the past, just how present my parents were to me, you know, as a kid. And some I had a really sensitive conscience and just um, my mom was always ready, you know, to hear me. And I think what my wife and I constantly battle is just the do we look closed off sometimes to our kids? There's going to be times where I'll have to work on my computer or, you know, my wife has like three different kind of side gigs and that sometimes requires screens. So again, the 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 alternative is not that we're on our kids beck and call all the time, um, but that we're just available and present. And if there's any teens, you know, listening to, I think the same thing applies just to think about um, how to navigate this space. You know, as I've talked to teens and tweens over the years, um, there's kind of just a, there's an acceptance that there are going to be barriers to conversation and that the students I've talked to have never said that they like that. They Nobody has ever said that they don't care when, when somebody interrupts them to check their phone, but they just kind of feel like what else, we just have to accept it. This is the way the world is. Um, and so I would just encourage things like, you know, stacking phones at the lunch table or you know, even just as teens hang out together, finding times to do some screen free stuff. Um, and I think Bear Creek is really wonderful at that. Um, and so if that's, you know, something you want, I think this is the school for you. And then the second thing. Um, oh, I just love this quote. Sorry, before I jump to number two um, from Turkle, she says, being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they're almost indistinguishable. Um, so try to think about a person that you know loves you so dearly and ask yourself, you know, do I feel heard by that person? Most likely the answer is going to be yes, you know, right? Because hearing, hearing and listening and love are just so intimately connected. And then I mentioned this just a moment ago um, in the more broad talk, but just I think solitude is, is crucial to friendship. And that might be surprising. Um, solitude, again, doesn't mean a mountainy hike. It can just be a state in which your mind is free from the from other inputs. So for me as a kid, it was often in the car. Um, sometimes the radio was on, but sometimes it wasn't. And just being able to sit, knowing if I needed my parents, I had their full attention. I'm looking out the window. You know, there's things for me to see, but just processing and processing my day, my emotions, my feelings, my worries, my hopes. Um, and when we have time to do that, then we have something to offer other people. If we never have time, to calculate, you know, who we are and what we feel, then we're, our existence is a lot more hollow and we don't have as much to bring to other people. Um, it's probably the simplest way I can put it. So solitude brings the capacity for self-reflection and empathy, the ability to clarify hard problems, build moral courage and resilience and considering what really matters in life. Um, and again, just to put, you know, kind of a, a another Bear Creek plug in here, um, you know, just from a developmental trajectory, we just, um, we keep our main campus K through eight screen free, you know, phone free. And I just think that's beautiful for our students, just as they're developing who they are, they're navigating who they are, especially at those middle school years, just not having that escapism, you know, that can come with a phone in your pocket. Um, it's not easy, right, you know, to, to, to engage with somebody when, you know, you're still developing those friendships or to work through some of that awkwardness, but we see kids do it every day and it's a beautiful thing. Um, another quote from Turkle, if we don't know the satisfactions of solitude, we only know the panic of loneliness. Um, and, you know, we may have all felt those moments. You know, I'm, I am too tethered to my phone than I should be most of the time. And I think there is, there are some of those moments where um, a panic sets in. Usually for me, it's on the other side. Like if I, my wife went on a big drive with the kids 
and I want to be able to check in, but she doesn't answer her phone or I check her. I, I look at her for her location just to see where she is in route. And um, I can't I don't get that data because she's in a you know, the network doesn't facilitate it there for me. I mean, there's been moments, a lot, a couple big moments of panic that have set in um, when again, just several not even that long ago that was never an option to check your spouse's location and and so it's while it's solving a problem in one way it's also creating one it's fueling kind of a, a new way of being anxious about our loved ones <clears throat> so a couple practical ideas for developing fundamental or skills fundamental to friendship um, i think a lot of the practice happens in the family at the family level right spend time together talking as a family I don't have a team, but I know enough to know that that second part is not easy. L linger at the dinner table. And I would just say, get creative. I mean, bring a game that everybody loves so that right when the food is finished, there's something to do. Have a question box. Um, find a way, find a way to not even coerce your, you know, your your children to stay at the table, but to make it attractive, you know, um, have a share time. Uh, I don't know, something something that really appeals to them to make it interesting to stay and linger. Second is um, to wake up before your devices and send them to bed before you go to sleep. Um, Andy Crouch actually has a really neat um, liturgy or habit of his own that he won't check it, look at his phone until he steps outside. And he lives in Philadelphia where it can be really cold, but it's just it's just that, that um, choice to connect with nature, mm -hmm. to remember that I'm a human being in the world before I'm a human being with access to the world, you know, everywhere, I think can be really powerful. And I would say, again, I don't know how many um, students are on here, but but I don't, this isn't necessarily, you know, just um, directed toward parents, toward their kids. I think parents need to model these things as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, just to fill the center of your home with things that reward skill and active engagement. And for me, that's kind of that tipping the hat at that, mm -hmm. that techne idea. You know, when we walk into our home, are, are we exposed to easy everywhere at some level, of course, because there's light switches, thermostats, um, you know, refrigerators and whatnot. But just as far as our activities and the things that we do with our time, are there things that we have access to? Are there pianos? Are there is there a craft table? Are there what things at our home just draw us in that really reward developing skill and active engagement? So those I think are just things I want to put on the table again as we as Kevin takes over and kind of talks about a um, answering this question, what resources do we have to establish, maintain, and develop friendships through devices? Because there's so much good that can happen um, for me personally, you know, for my kids to be in touch with family members who live, you know, out of state and to have something like FaceTime is amazing. You know, I want them to know my mom and she's a 12 hour drive. And so um, I'm so thankful for the ways that technology connects us as well. Um, and so Kevin, I'll, I'll um, send it over to you to kind of develop that. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to walk us through some various platforms in a minute together. Um, th this is some great stuff. And I know that this is one of the areas that as a parent myself, I have a, a teenager now, which is crazy to think about um, that my son is 13. He's in eighth grade. And so Nathan knows him. Um, I hope he doesn't give Nathan too much problems. Um, but uh, my... Just a lot of good puns and jokes, which he knows <laughs> I appreciate. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <clears throat> Pardon me. And then um, I, my daughter is 10 and in fifth grade. Um, you know, they're they're right in that inflection point of working with technology so much. And it's I think it's one of those times where as a parent, you you we're all stepping into new waters to a certain extent and doing the best we can. And so I'd say the first resource that we have for working with this is other parents that are also going through this process and talking to one another and just and the second piece which is super important when working with teenagers especially especially upper schoolers i have an opportunity to talk to high schoolers a lot about this is to be open and transparent about what it is that you're working towards what you're looking for and that sort of thing with them um, um sometimes um upper schooler teenagers feel like it's too much targeted um towards a particular object or something um so parents will complain like you're on your phone too much um and um uh, it's very hard to explain but um you know teenagers experience the world uh, uh very differently than we did when we were teenagers um mm -hmm. we live at this really weird time where 
um, the technology that we have, we are familiar with living at a time when we didn't have that. Mm -hmm. And so we have this kind of keen awareness of being able to exist without it and then being able to pick it up and this weird like relationship that happens and our teenagers just don't have that that mental recognition they've been surrounded by this this is why the joke about asking a 12 year old to come and set the clock on your vcr came up even years ago right well at this point they're like what's a vcr um you know in the meantime if you want them to reprogram your your ios they're going to be like yeah sure give me 15 minutes and i'll take care of it for you um and meanwhile we're like yeah thanks um they're just they it's not just that their technology fluid it's that their entire world is seen through a lens of a hyper engagement through this stuff to the point where it's it's almost a cultural translation project and as parents and as educators, when we're in this conversation with them, we have to approach it like we're in a translation effort. Not that it's a logical and assumed fact that everyone would just common sense see it because it's like speaking a foreign language um, with them. And so I think it helps when we realize that we have to be really specific with what we want from our students. So instead of just saying things like, hey, you're on your phone too much. When I, when I come to my son and I'm like, hey, we're watching a movie together and you're on your phone right now. That makes me feel like you're really not part of the family watching the phone right now. Can you put the phone away so we can feel like we're having family time right now? He's super ready to respond to that. There's not even an argument. He's like, oh yeah, sure, that's fine. And puts the phone away because he wants to be emotionally responsive to what's happening in the family. He just doesn't, he just needs some specific guidance for what that means in that space and so being very specific with what you're going for um can help and then honestly if at that point they're like no um then you have a, a real true heart-to-heart -heart conversation with what's happening which is more than just it's about a phone it's now about like well we've got some relational stuff that we got to work on which is what you're trying to get to the heart of um but most kids honestly they want to engage they want to be a part of the family they're just struggling because of the, again, the cultural translation piece. Um, be, learned habits from watching friends. And honestly, and this is the part that as a parent I struggle with, learn habits by watching me and um, things that they've seen me do, right? So uh, I had to have a, a, a come to Jesus moment myself when I was like, Quentin, you shouldn't bring your phone to the, to the dinner table. Oh, crap. <laughs> and then I had to be like, okay. Um, the phone's going away from the dinner table and, you know, it's just that type of stuff, right? So yeah. have a lot of grace for yourself in this moment. Um, talk to your teenager about their experiences and why it's important to them. And I think that's really important to do. Not because they're wise in this. I think it's really important to qualify that you're bringing the wisdom to the conversation but they're bringing the facts to the conversation um, because they have an experience with their friends that um, and what's happening in their world that, again, part of that cultural translation piece, we're just not really intimately familiar with. A lot of our students are engaging now with one another in some ways similarly to what we did as kids through a lot of shared experiences. But those shared experiences are now happening online. They're not happening because they're not getting out in the woods. Their days are hyper structured. I mean, when you really think about it, their days, they move through very regimented schedules in a day. Uh, these ideas of having like multiple hours at the end of a school day before parents come home and, you know, the, you know, and that sort of thing where there's not something for them to do, that's just not happening any longer. Most of them are like, well, now I've got my sports activity, my music practice, I've got um, my hours of homework in the case of an upper school student in some circumstances, families coming home, if I've got my chores, and then by the time I'm actually engaging with my friends in some kind of social activity that's actually unstructured, it's probably 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night and I'm opting for some kind of online game or online TikTok watching session and that sort of thing because it's a shared experience um, and that sort of thing. So 
Uh, what we have is circumstances where they're still doing shared experiences, but their structure of day does not really allow for the type of free form uh, flowing that we had uh, growing up. Um, they're also really connected by images and video. Um, so they converse, but um, it's an age, it's a generation that the image is powerful. Um, and it's the meme culture and all that stuff. And sometimes it throws us off, but it's really about image, uh, not just personal image in that sense, but about pictures and video and whatnot. And so as a result, most of their online mechanisms are about being able to perpetuate and push images for them to engage um, because that's important for them to rally around and converse around. Um, so it's pretty it's pretty powerful stuff, but it, it requires us to realize that um, the idea of them sitting sometimes and having um, what they would consider to be abstract conversation is a little bit more difficult for them now because they're so joined by the presence of the experience and the image um, together. And so that's why um, the idea of talking on the phone is diminishing, where in the past we used to love to talk on the phone and even the concept of a text message where you know we still text one another because the text is a quick touch point for you and I. I might text Nathan, hey Nathan, but Nathan and I have this really big relationship outside of this that the text isn't supposed to supplant that. It's supposed to send some quick data um, uh, for us to connect on. Well, for the students, um, the text doesn't send image as well. It doesn't let them rally around image and stuff as easily. So they have turned to some to a variety of other platforms that allow them to move and ebb and flow with experience and image more robustly and more conveniently. Um, the other day I was at Watershed with uh, Quentin's middle school cross country team and it was so ironic because I had just finished uh, prepping all of this material to talk to you about and a parent was standing there and was like, oh, my kid wants to get on Discord and I don't even know what Discord is. Like, what is Discord? I mean, like, and then another parent was like, yeah, uh, Discord, I've heard about this. And then the, her daughter, who I know, comes up and she's like, yeah, everyone's on Discord. And then the mom's like, I thought everyone's on Teams. She's like, that's what the school uses. And then so like, so I decided today, I was already going to do this with you. I decided today that probably one of the easy, a, a really useful tool to give you all is actually to run you through about five social media tools that your student uses or considers using to actually relate to other students. Um, my hope is that then when your student says, hey, I want to get on Discord, you can be like, I don't know what Discord is, but you can actually have a tool to be like, I know what Discord is, or, or um, Snapchat or something else like this, or um, Instagram. So we're going to take some time uh, to just walk through some compare and contrast between the different social media platforms, recommended ages, and then I'm going to try and be quiet and open it up to questions. But in the meantime, if you do have questions, um, there's a really cool raise your hand feature at the top of the screen, and I would love for you just to raise your hand so that I'll know to be quiet and just take the question so we can have an engaging conversation as we go along. Um, so um, the five platforms which I uh, am talking about today, it's not that there's not more, but these five tend to be the biggest uh, vehicles right now for students to engage one another. Uh, Facebook Messenger Kids, um, Facebook Messenger, Instagram, uh, Discord, and Snapchat. And um, there's a lot of text, and this will be available to you through resources after this event. They'll be pushed, so you'll be able to review, so you don't need to furiously write down notes or anything. Um, today is just kind of to get you familiar with it. And I'm going to try and do brief summaries, and rather than do deep dives, you can look at it deeper later on. Um, so Facebook Messenger Kids. It is recommended for kids about age seven through 12. Uh, it is designed for Facebook. Um, it is, they do not need to have a Facebook account. It's run through the parent's account. Um, it makes it possible for younger kids to engage with other young kids um, and even family members on Facebook that you might have. So like if grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, uh, whatnot is on Facebook, they can, they can chat directly with them. Uh, but it's all done through the parent's account so that technically while the student has an individual IM account or instant messaging account, the parent has oversight um, and has a lot of granular control. 
Um, Facebook Messenger is, of course, the main messenger feature that is attached to um, the main mess, uh, Facebook platform. Um, side note, which we're going to talk about later, your students will almost never use Facebook except when they graduate. They will probably make a Facebook account. Most students see Facebook more akin to LinkedIn than they do to actual like social media -y stuff. Um, so they see Facebook as a grown up platform. Um, they do not see it as they see it more as professional networking um, at this point, which might sound kind of funny to us because we don't see it necessarily that way. We we share the funny family photos and stuff, but no, our students definitely would are like, or they know what Facebook is and they're like, yeah, that's where that's where older people go. <laughs> we don't go to Facebook and you're like, well, thanks, child. Um, so appreciate that. Um, but yeah, no, they don't do this. Um, the Facebook instant messenger features, however, are quite extensive and um, probably even more extensive than most people realize. And so I've got many things in here which include things like encrypted conversations and whatnot. Um, but it, things that people don't realize is that the IM features are oftentimes allowing um, for um, people to, um, well, two minutes left. Okay, I'm not going to have much time then to go through this. Um, the, the They're not going to give much, a, They the IM features allow for a lot of their other like financial supports and things like this to actually operate to a lot of their um, um, financial aids run through that or their, their shopping carts, excuse me, thank you. Instagram is also run by Facebook and it's a picture sharing and video sharing platform and most students run through Instagram um, at this point in time. Um, they are, um, this is where most of our students will run their instant messaging um, components um, and um, they live on Instagram. Um, Discord was originally created for gamers. Um, it's actually kind of like a gamers team um, and the game, the the Discord allows kids to create their own little channel setups. Um, have um, have the ability to do um, video conferencing calls, etc., and just um, be able to talk with their friends. It's really popular with students because it it has low frame rate and low resource requirement, and so a lot of students are moving toward Discord uh, because even though it was originally designed for gamers, it's 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 become much more ubiquitous for talking. It's actually one of the largest growing instant messaging components. Um, it's almost beat Snapchat. Snapchat is um, is a service that allows students to um, is very popular. It allows students to take quick pictures and those pictures will disappear. Um, the ostensible reason is to like share a moment with somebody. Um, it's you know, it's that it's that little thing that you don't really want to clog their headspace with forever um, or sit in a feed forever. But you're like, hey, yeah, this was kind of a cool thing. Um, and so you put it on there and um, like you saw a butterfly, you're like, ooh, a butterfly, and you put it up and then it's going to disappear. Uh, and your friends are going to see it and say like, oh, we know you love butterflies. Um, and so like in Facebook, that's why if you have things like the feed and then you put something there and you're like, where'd the picture go? I put it up there and it disappeared. Well, it's Facebook copying Snapchat um, in that moment. Um, so it's trying to do that. So, um, or story is what's happening there. So uh, Snapchat's kind of dying a little bit. It's not dying in the sense of like there's no users. It still has millions of users, but um, uh, it most students in the upper school right now are moving to Instagram pretty hard. Um, so um, we go through a lot more details through the remainder of the slides that include like are there parental controls for the most part beyond um, Facebook Messenger. There are almost no major parental controls for any other type of IM um, platform out there. I would say the best parental control that can be put into place in any instant messaging component, especially for younger students, is establish early the need for transparency in these platforms, that you need to be able to pick up their phone, to pick up their computer, and to read chat messages, especially when they're first getting on these platforms for the first time, um, and able to look at these things. Um, because and and just to see what their friends are saying to them and the kind of things be a part of their conversation and use it not to get mad at them but like hey your friends are you know your friends are saying a lot of swear words <laughs> right now how are you handling that you know or um you know or if 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 timmy's posting some awkward content be like 
Timmy's posting some really awkward content. I'm not sure I'm comfortable about this. Um, your kids are willing to have the conversation about it if you establish it early um, and that that's kind of the family expectation. So create this as a live thing. The other piece why I'm telling you this is because um, sometimes when student disciplinary issues come up um, and families are like, well, I see their Instagram, I see their Facebook, um, I can see what they're posting. You can't always see what they're posting. And I need you to and I need you to understand this piece. The two pieces are number one, they can restrict content to show to certain audiences. And so you may just never see it. But number two, um, that does not mean that even if they are showing everything on their public side, you may not be seeing what they're putting in their IMs, their their chats. And so you need to be able to have access to seeing those things too. And so, you know, if something comes up, if they're talking about how they're being bullied, don't just look straight at the public facing stuff. Go look at the chats. Go look at the stuff that they're receiving in direct messages from from peers and stuff, because that's where this stuff comes out. OK, uh, given that we're out of time, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up there for my stuff. Um, we have more data on this slides that can run through granular controls, things like this. Does it age well for your family? Um, how easy is it for them to get access to unrestricted content and then what are the privacy and data collection policies so that you know when you sign your kids up how much um, freedom how much information are they taking because most of these platforms are not actually free they're they don't cost you money but that's because you're paying in data um, you're paying in information um, so it's good for you to just be aware as you're moving through and, and your kids are like hey i really need this because everybody's talking about this and using this. So, all right, I'm gonna be quiet now. Um, thanks, uh, I'm sorry if I talked too long, but I appreciate the time uh, in in working through this, so. There's a link in the chat that Katie Gomakai would. Uh... All righty, Amanda, are you able to see that? I am, everything looks great, Kara. Great. All right, well, let's get started. Um, good morning, parents. Thank you so much for joining us today, um, for sharing your Saturday morning with us. We feel so special. Um, we're so excited to present um, this sub um, conversation on our Tools for Success Technology Through the Ages about technology and technology-free family fun. And so just as a quick introduction, um, Karen and I really just wanted to make sure you knew who we were and get to know us a little bit better. So um, I'm Mrs. Amanda Gratton, and I was so lucky and, and fortunate to join the Bear Creek School last September in 2020. And um, I've been teaching kindergarten um, these past uh, two school years, um, which is just the best thing ever. And um, Karen and I, we also wanted to share a way that we feel God has blessed our lives um, with, with with giving us this calling, this vocation to be teachers and just how this opportunity has impacted us. And I'd like to just share this opportunity that I had in 2017 where I was able to visit Haiti for a week. And um, I did this through um, Seattle Pacific University where I'm currently enrolled. And I was able to teach at various schools throughout the country and really get to um, uh, learn the culture and interact with the wonderful people um, that are in the country of Haiti and just learn and really just be um, just appreciate um, their way of living and their amazing energy that they have um, in that beautiful country. Hi, I'm Kara Morris, and like Amanda, I also joined the Bear Creek School in 2020, and I've been teaching third grade for the last two years here. And then a way that teaching has blessed my life is um, kind of similar to Amanda, but um, I was able to teach abroad for a few weeks in China um, when I was in college. And this class you can see in the picture here on the right um, in particular just really inspired me because um, large group of middle schoolers, over 60 in the class um, in quite a small room, limited technology, but they were just some of the most respectful and joyful and engaged students that I've ever had the privilege of working with. So that was really a time that um, I was blessed and inspired as a teacher. And then next I'm going to go ahead and talk about topics that we'll be covering today in our breakout session. So Amanda will actually be starting by talking about the current recommendations from the AAP or the American Academy of Pediatrics 
for screen time um, for students in different age groups. And then she's going to go into some of the current research on ways that parents can support healthy media usage at home and also some of the positive influences of technology that we're seeing in our students right now. And then after that, I'm going to go into more of the practical um, based on this research. So I'll be giving lots of resources and websites for um, ways that you can experience some technology based and technology free family fun. And then if we have a little bit of time at the end, um, we can do a little Q&A. So if you have questions along the way, write those down and be ready to share them at the end if we have time. Thanks, Kara. Um, so being teachers in the lower school, we have an opportunity to be working with um, children um, at ages five to 10. And of course, we know that the Bear Creek School enrolls um, our youngest learners, our preschoolers down at the Valley Campus. And so we get a lot of questions from parents um, when they're at that beginning stage of introducing technology to their children. Um, questions about how much or what kinds. And so we just kind of wanted to set the foundation and hopefully we're answering a couple of your questions you may have, or you may just be reiterating things you already know. Um, um, but starting with children ages two to five, so again, the um, adorable little loves we see down at the Valley Campus, um, the recommendation is about an hour per day, um, and it's also based on high quality programs. And if you have a child ages two to five, the recommendation is that you really um, absorb the role as a co-viewer, and so you are close enough to be seeing what your child is viewing and hearing what they're viewing, just as a way to monitor, but also to help them apply it and understand it and so it's not just a just not just an input but there's like almost like a conversation going um, and then when we get to the more school aged um, um, or, or children of school age so six and older the recommendation is really just a consistent limit on time spent with technology and so this is really where your specific family's needs and dynamics um, and what works best for you and your children, this is where that comes into play. Um, and then it's just really making sure that the types of media your child is exposed to and the um, technolog technological activities that they're doing are not replacing adequate sleep, physical activity, or other really important behaviors essential to health such as taking breaks for proper meals, um, or of course socialization and spending time with our, our family and our friends. Um, and while I was researching this topic, um, I found re two really interesting recommendations that seem to repeat quite often. Um, but the idea of designating technology-free times throughout the day, and also maybe technology-free zones or locations in your, in your household. And so it's just setting up those parameters or boundaries of what you and your partner um, or the, the adults in the household may feel is appropriate for the children children and for your family. And then again, in a little bit of the, um, the older um, children, maybe in more middle school or um, upper lower school, and then of course the upper school, um, it's just that ongoing communication about digital citizenship and um, uh, safety etiquette and just knowing how a lot of the, that, those behaviors um, can really translate on and off the screen. And another really exciting um, um, idea and topic that kept popping up is the empowerment of parents at this um, exciting time when you may be introducing technology to your child or you may be continuing to implement it um, since we know right now what the world is like and what society is like and we have this amazing tool at our fingertips. So how do we make sure that we're implementing healthy um, relationship with technology and media? And so um, it's just really that you should be thinking proactively about your child's media use and talking about it. So it's not just some isolated activity that they do, but much more an interactive and um, 
kind of live opportunity for conversation and growth and learning. And again, just the reiteration that technology use should should really never take over those important things during the day that children need in their development. The playing, the studying, the talking, the sleeping, um, and of course, eating healthy snacks and hydrating and just taking care of yourself. Um, I read a lot about and and kind of was introduced myself to this term media mentor. So again, this real this empowerment as parents and teachers to be a mentor of media for our children and our students. And that's really you teaching your child about how to use technology as a tool for creating and connecting and learning. And I think that really um, sounds or um, really re resonates well with what um, Nathan Pettit spoke about earlier um, this morning. Um, and just really allowing yourself to set you and your partner to set that kind of tone for what technology usage in your family looks like. And again, it's really only a problem or a concern if your child is replacing technology with physical activity or hands-on exploration. Um, and again, face-to-face -face social interaction, those things that regardless of how wonderful technology is, they just can't replace. Um, and then lastly, we know that too much screen time can really um, affect and harm the amount and quality of sleep. We know that the screen can kind of send like a pseudo stimulation and it can create the brain, uh, um, a cause the brain to feel awake when we really should be shutting off. And sleep is so important for children in their in their development. Um, and so just to know that the power of technology in that piece, but also some of the things that may start to go down um, a road that we would want to avoid. And um, the positive effects of technology. And so this is really why we're here. Um, we see technology and we embrace technology. Kara and I love teaching at the Bear Creek School. We have so many opportunities um, to use technology. The, um, our students are seeing us with our um, devices, our surfaces. They see us managing our owl cameras, our projectors. And then you can even go further as to their wonderful computer programming classes with Mr. Grant or the opportunity to have iPads and their own student laptops throughout the day, depending on their lessons or their classes that they're taking. And so these are exciting things we're seeing and the reasons why um, technology and education really go so well together is because it's enhancing learning. What used to be just a one dimensional activity now all of a sudden um, becomes something so much more, especially with maps or geography. Um, we would have to draw our finger and find those coordinates and now we can go to that place or we can see it or we can actually manipulate the way a continent see or lay on the globe. It also improves language skills. Um, this is great for children who are just emerging with their English language, but also much beyond that. Um, learning a new language as an adult, we know the Rosetta Stone and so many other wonderful programs that allow us to learn languages and practice them. It fosters problem solving skills um, in independent opportunities where we're just working with just ourself and our device or with a group huddled around a computer. And we see um, software such as Minecraft or coding that really in, um, implores the children to use those skills while they're having fun. It builds creativity and imagination. So on the same breath as going from that very much one dimensional poster board with the markers, which is the way I did all my presentations when I was growing up, now all of a sudden kids are making PowerPoints or they're exploring with Flipgrids or all these other wonderful um, software and programs. And it's allowing them to just set the bar and just to think or set the bar high and to think outside the box. Um, and then lastly, it develops future technological leaders. And we know the way the world is is moving. We see this in our own our own fields and careers. And we know that for our children to keep up with that pace and to be competitive in that future career or future education that lays ahead, um, it's important for them to have this exposure and this practice, have the healthy balance of both, and develop a really healthy relationship with technology. Thanks, Amanda. 
Alrighty, I'm going to go ahead and move into more of that practical um, application for this research and um, I'm going to be sharing a lot of different links and a lot of resources with you now. So now would be a great time to grab out that cell phone um, if you would like to take screenshots or take some notes on a notepad um, and just uh, so everyone knows this this meeting is being recorded and um, will be the links to these PowerPoints will be sent out to parents who are enrolled in um, the tools for success after um, after the meeting today. So a few ways that you can experience some family fun with technology. Um, first of all, virtual field trips. So right now, you know, students may not be going on as many field trips in the classroom or um, at their school. And so there's a lot of great opportunities for taking virtual field trips. And these are a few um, links that I actually use in my classroom and you can also use at home. So the first two on the top, um, these are two zoos in California, the San Diego Zoo and the Monterey Bay Aquarium that actually have live cameras set up in their habitats all throughout their zoo um, that you can you know watch and and actually see in live time um, what the animals are up to so that's a really fun um, experience for kids and it's just a great way to feel like you're at the zoo um, but you're virtual and then the third one there discoveryeducation.com this is a great resource for a lot of reasons but they also have a tab specifically about virtual field trips and they have lots of upcoming ones and also past recorded ones that you can um, take with your student and there's all sorts of different ones on there so that I would highly recommend checking out that website. And then along with virtual field trips, there's great opportunities online for educational videos. Um, so a few resources for that uh, nationalgeographic.com and then there's a specifically a kids site has lots of great videos um, that are short and very interest based and great for kids to learn all about science and animals. Um, and then Mystery Doug is another great science resource that I like to use in my classroom. And there's a weekly video, um, very investigative and very um, of interest to, to students. So check that one out as well. And then Art for Kids Hub is a great art resource um, that allows students to complete art projects in about 20 to 30 minutes um, with very limited resources and you don't have to be a professional artist to follow along with those videos so kids really love those ones and then this last one here for educational videos um, ed.ted.com is actually a branch off of ted talks but it's specifically geared towards students and I would recommend this for older students, maybe middle or high school level. Um, lots of great videos there, um, really highly reviewed and just really impactful. And then moving along to Freckle, Epic and AR. So these are three um, sites that our school uses and most classroom teachers use with their students um, on a regular basis. And so Freckle is a great resource for um, practicing English skills such as reading, writing, grammar, and spelling. And students practice in the classroom, but you can also um, give them time at home to continue practicing. And they'll have their own class code that they can get from their teacher. And then the more that they practice in Freckle, um, the more the teacher is able to get reports and see what skills they're working on and how they can then support them better in the classroom. So that's a really great uh, resource for you. And then Epic is a great reading resource that allows students to read all sorts of different books at their level, at an age appropriate level set by their teacher. And there will also be a class code for that one. And the site to get there is getepic.com. And then lastly on here, AR, that stands for Accelerated Reader. And this is a program that the Bear Creek School uses each year to inspire students to read more books and promote a little bit of healthy competition between students to read a lot of books and earn some points through AR. And so this long link here is the one that 
our school's um, accelerated reader program is through. So that's the link that you'll need to use. And um, once students log in there, they can take quizzes on books that they've read and can earn points um, that will stack on throughout the year. And then we get to celebrate those points at the end of the year. And just another note on the AR link, those do update every year. And so it's important that you have the right one. So uh, take a picture of this one or write it down and that way your student can access that from home. And then finally, uh, as we know, you know, during these times, it's a little bit harder to have face to face interactions with people. Um, and so maintaining that social interaction with family and friends is super important um, to to your child. And so being able to use sites such as Teams, Zoom and FaceTime for video conferencing with family and friends. And then we also found a couple of really cool resources for connecting with people around the world in more of a global um, video conferencing exchange. And so a few I wanted to highlight here, penpalschools.com is a site that a lot of schools use and students can collaborate with other students on projects that they're working on in school or on different lessons or subjects. And then really, really awesome is this digital exchange program um, through the site myprojectexchange.com. And this is geared more towards high school students or even college age students and allows them to actually take part in a virtual exchange or study abroad experience. So I pulled a quote um, from their website that I'm going to read to you that kind of explains this further, but I'm very excited about it and I want to do it. So I hope that some of you can um, take a look at that and maybe get your student involved. So from their website, it says the digital exchange program is a free, woo -woo, fully online study abroad experience. Students are matched with a peer from a different country and over the eight week program participate in weekly video calls and activities to simulate the authentic study abroad experience. Pairs of students are grouped into families and matched with a facilitator, mentors who help the group dig deeper, build community, and make sense of what they're learning. And after the program, students will have increased cross-cultural understanding and have the tools they need to learn from and work with people who are different from them to tackle global issues. So really, really cool opportunity there for those older students. And now I'm going to move on to um, family fun without technology. So as Amanda was sharing earlier, super important to have that balance between um, being on the screen and off the screen. Um, and so here are some great resources for things that you can do with a family off the screen. So for reading and writing extensions, um, I found a couple of things here that I thought were pretty awesome. Uh, the first one being a reading program uh, that a lot of animal shelters actually have where students can apply. Some of them you have to apply and some of them not, um, but you can go in and read a book to the animals um, at the animal shelter. And so this is great for kids. It improves their reading skills and it's also been proven to be great for the animals. So that would be a really cool opportunity to look into. And this link in particular is one that I found um, through the Auburn Valley Humane Society, the Shelter Buddies Reading Program. And then for writing, um, this is an awesome website, writeoncampaign.com, and it connects you to different programs that are accepting love or encouragement letters um, and sending them along to people in need of some encouragement. So there's all sorts of different organizations that this website can connect your family to um, and students can write letters um, and send those along to someone in need. So that's another great one there. And then of course we know we live in a very beautiful state um, and we can get out and experience God's creation in nature. And so here are some resources for some of our national parks um, listed there and then a great website for hiking trails where you can actually see 
um, which trails are family friendly, great for kids. You can see the difficulty levels and the reviews. So that's the alltrails.com link there. And then some great zoos in Washington. We have a lot. Um, I just posted two of the big ones here. So this first link is for Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium, and that's in Tacoma. And then the second one here is the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle. And then third one on this list, fun classes for the family. So we live in an area that has a ton of great classes in all sorts of different um, subjects and interest categories. Uh, so a few here, these ones are all in Redmond um, and were very highly rated, highly reviewed. So for cooking, if your family likes to cook, um, there's a website here for whiskcooks.com and you can go in and take classes um, with your kids and teens and they have specific family classes for cooking. And then music and art um, in Redmond, there's a uh, website here for a company called Bach to Rock music.com and they have again family friendly classes for your family to learn different music skills or different instruments and then for art drawn to art studios.com is an art studio in Redmond that offers family classes and for sports we've got Eastside Family Karate a family uh, karate business and then goldfish swim school.com so just a few um, ideas for some ways to get your kids active and um, in some sports classes. And then some other um, family outing ideas here. We've got some great museums in the area. Kids Quest Museum in Bellevue and then the Children's Museum in Seattle. And this would be great for hands on learning experiences um, for your kids. And then finally, I put this in here because I love it myself, but if you haven't ever tried this, uh, you've got to try an escape room. Um, there's plenty around, but a couple here in Redmond are Conundrum and Quest Factor. And this would be a great opportunity for your family to solve some puzzles together, solve a mystery, um, practice those critical thinking, problem solving skills together and just have a blast. And something I wanted to mention about Conundrum specifically is that they actually have an outdoor um, escape room experience in Redmond. And so you can walk around the city with your family and um, solve some puzzles in Redmond. So really cool um, one there. And that kind of brings us to our close. So thank you so much for being here today and again for spending your Saturday with us. Um, we're really excited that we're able to share this information with you today. And just to kind of reiterate a few um, of our big points for today, uh, we want to make sure that any activities with the family, whether technology based or not, are interesting and engaging for kids and or extend on their experiences or interests. And then finding that balance of technology free and technology based fun. Really important and then most important of all making the choices that are right for your family because you know your family best, you know what they need, what you need. And so you are the most important person in making those choices. Alrighty, and it looks like we have just a few minutes here um, to maybe take some questions or um, if you are wanting to head out to learn more about the Bear Creek School um, for you perspe prospective families, there's a link in that chat as well that will take you there and that starts at 1015. So if anyone has questions, feel free to um, post a question in the chat if you're able to and Amanda and I will stay here for a minute um, to answer answer some questions. All right, thanks again, everyone. If you wanna head out, you're free to do that. If you wanna join that admissions meeting to learn more about the Bear Creek School, that's in the chat. And we're just so glad that you were able to be here with us today. Thanks so much. Yes, thanks, yes, thanks for, for joining, joining us, everyone.
All right, so I'm seeing maybe a couple questions start to, or maybe some thank yous. Oh, thank you, Lucas. Have a great rest of your day. Anyone has any questions, you can post them in the chat. And that meeting um, for learning more about the Bear Creek School is starting now. So if you're not seeing the link to that in the chat, um, let us know, but should be there for you to, to click and join. Thank you, Luke. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Andy and Lucas, if either of you have a question, feel free to post that in the chat if you're able to. Um, and if not, we're so thankful you were able to be here and you can go ahead and head out if you're ready. Thanks so much. Amanda, do we want to go ahead and leave? Yes, I think that that's okay. at this point it's probably um, safe to say that any questions were answered or they'll reach out in a different way. Yeah. All right. Okay. Great job, Kara. <laughs> See you later. See ya. Bye. Okay, I want to do this in the best possible way and I'm going to welcome you this morning. I'm, I think I'm going to switch the view so I can see what I'm doing here. Let's do it like this. Here we go. Can you see my screen? I hope. Um, I'm going to leave my chat open so that I can um, see you and what your comments are, hopefully. So you should be able to um, to respond in the in the chat. But I want to welcome you and maybe have you put in the chat what grade your child is in. Just um, stick that in the in the chat. We can kind of see um, who's here in in that case. And also, I thought I'd take a minute to um, maybe do an activity I call uh, Rose and Thorn. And. A, a rose is something that you find is great about tech and a thorn would be something that um, you find difficult about about tech. And for me, if I was putting this in um, to the chat, I would say a rose for me is it's great for staying in touch with lots of people, my own my own family members, but also people from college or high school or sort of distant relatives it's been it's been great to be able to stay in touch but for me it's also easy for me to get lost um, in wasting time so i think we can we can all relate to some of those times when we've scrolled too long or gotten interested in something that we hadn't meant to and um, see that 30 minutes have gone by so um, I just thought I'd mention that rose and thorn activity. If you've got something that is is really great for you about technology, um, let us hear from you. And if you've got a thorn, let us know that too. So I'm going to introduce myself and get started. I'm Linda Graham, and I've been at the Bear Creek School for 22 years. So I've taught ninth grade conceptual physics, AP physics, engineering, and a few math classes here and there. A few years ago, I was asked to take on a new position as innovation coach and scale back on my teaching duty. So I really have the best of all the worlds. I teach 
which I love, but I still get to help think strategically about innovation at Bear Creek. So I'm a parent of two Bear Creek alums, Mac and Beth. So I know the parenting ropes and I've learned a few things about tech that I want to share with you today. So I, at the risk of, of it flopping, I have a joke to share with you. So I'm going to let you um, ponder on that for a minute and see if it makes you chuckle like it did me. I'll come back to that in just a minute. But first, a few ground rules. For as many families as are represented here today, there are just as many viewpoints about styles of parenting represented. So we want to respect those differences. And certainly Bear Creek wants to respect parenting differences. Has your child ever complained that another family does such and such? And why can't we do that? I think it's a great opportunity to turn that into a conversation and listen to your child. You may be able to either find a common ground or at the least help them understand why your family has chosen a particular stance. Bottom line, we all love our kids deeply and want them to grow to be the individual God intends, full of wisdom, compassion, and courage. With that in mind, let's get down to the nitty gritty and look at some real families do. Believe it or not, I know one family that literally pulls the plug on the Wi-Fi between certain hours every night so no one is tempted to be on the internet, adults included. So your hours might differ, but it's something you might want to think about. Another family I know requires all the phones to go into a storage box at night. Some teens and tweens without this hedge around them never really get a good night's sleep. Too many interruptions from texts, gaming, or endless scrolling. So think about that. What about this? If you're going to not have phones in the bedroom at night, you'll need an old fashioned alarm clock to ensure a good night's sleep. But I think that good night's sleep will be worth it. Some families allow screens only in common areas of the house or if in the bedroom turned so that they're in plain view with an open door. It just keeps everyone on their best behavior. Some families have a weekly time to touch base. Maybe it's a regular time to go over the schedule for the coming week or talk over other family business. This is a great time for a tech check in. As a parent, stay curious, not accusing, and make it a time to ask how to use an app or what your child likes about an app like Instagram or Snapchat. Are there any downsides? Make it a regular habit to look at their phone and ask about new apps that appear. Decide if there'll be a vetting process before new apps are installed. Trust, but verify. Let them know you trust them but you do want them to be safe in terms of their emotions and reputations. I'm just wondering, do you have a great idea like some of these that are working for your family? Put it in the chat for us. Maybe it's something that we could use too. Well, hopefully some ideas will come in. And let's take a look at what Bear Creek is doing. So whether you have students at Bear Creek or not, you can use some of these same resources. We'll provide links um, when we send you the, the PowerPoint. But here's the thing. We issue Surface Pros to our incoming ninth grade students but we explain to them that the device belongs to the family. This means that families set the rules for use at home. We have some rules for use at school, of course, but that means you can install parental controls. You can set the parameters for installing any software because we believe that's an important thing. So we try to make that very clear to the students 
It's not just your device. It belongs to your family. And prior to the distribution of the Surface Pro, we require students to watch an interactive video training about digital citizenship that addresses internet safety and privacy, digital footprint, internet access and computer use uh, policy. So those are important things. I think of it a little bit like um, when you think about uh, your child and getting their driver's license, of course, there's extensive training before you're going to put them behind the wheel. So we want to have um, at least some kind of training for our students before we put them in front of the screen. And I think that's an important thing to think about. So you might, might think about it like that. Well, let's go on. I want you to know that Bear Creek is very intentional about putting a great digital citizenship curriculum into place in our middle and upper schools. And we're doing that in our house system on a monthly basis in, in addition to individual teachers that are highlighting topics that make sense for discussion in their classes. And the, the same is true for middle school, a very intentional program of uh, discussing digital citizenship. But parents, you can join uh, uh, an organization that we are using or drawing from for our, our curriculum. It's called Common Sense. So we're going to share the link for that too, or you can find it on our Bear Creek webpage. We'll share some of those later. One of the things we talk about, in fact, we've, we've held this session already uh, for upper school, but is the idea of media balance and well-being. Today we live in a world that's overflowing with digital media and technology, and all of us adults and kids have constant access to real-time information around the globe. We need to think about, do the benefits of being connected all the time also come with risks to our mental health? It's an important question to ask, especially for our kids. The media balance and well-being lessons give students the space to reflect on their own media use. Plus, they'll get the tools they need to think critically about how digital media affects our communities and science. Uh, in our society overall. So that's um, already happened in the upper school and it'll be an ongoing conversation. It, it was interesting for me as a, a mentor to a, a small group of young women to really have a, a great discussion about this in one of our, our mentor group times. So they have some great ideas and it was a, it was a very good conversation. Another topic we'll be talking about is privacy and security. So this topic introduces students to the concept of online privacy and the potential implications of sharing private information with a range of people, their friends, the public, app providers. Sharing information about yourself can be a natural and healthy activity, and it can lead to positive connections and personal growth. However, it can also present safety risks. And students need to be aware of potentially harmful consequences, such as identity theft and financial exploitation. When I've done the digital citizenship um, at, in the first years of handing out the Surface Pros, doing it live and having it be a realization for students as we did that, how much thought needs to go into um, secure passwords and Identity theft, they had no idea about really. So I think it's, it's a very valuable conversation to have. And now you can have that too and use some of the common sense media to help with that. Another topic that's important to discuss is digital footprint and identity. In this time of 24 seven connectivity, we might ask, do the benefits of online sharing outweigh the risks? So lessons from this topic will ask students to consider how sharing information online can affect them and others and will support them in learning to reflect before they reveal, as well as encourage others to do the same. Students will learn the pros and cons of having different personae and explore how they present themselves differently online and that that might affect their sense of self, their reputations and their relationships. So, uh, some great discussions can be had um, about why do we, when we look at Instagram or um, in my generation more at Facebook, uh, things like that, we're trying to always present our best 
most wonderful self and what does that that really do so thinking about that as we progress and look at this um, idea of relationship and communication we know that our online and offline um, situations that line continues to blur and the lessons from this segment has students reflect on how they can use intrapersonal and interpersonal skills to build and strengthen positive online communication and communities. They'll explore common digital stressors and their influences on relationships. Students will also gain an understanding of how to communicate effectively online and how and why some topics and conversations can best lend themselves to certain mediums. Uh, one of the things that is important to think about is our formal communication in emails, things like that. Uh, are, are different than a texting conversation. And so that's a, an important skill to remember. And who among us hasn't, um, in a, a moment of emotion, sent something that we wished we hadn't sent? So uh, thinking before you click send and taking time to, to contemplate that is really important, uh, even for adults. So we'll we'll be exploring that. Lessons on the topic of digital drama, cyberbullying, and hate speech help students um, think about themselves and their larger communities. They'll explore the roles that people play and how individual actions, negative and positive, intentional and unintentional, can affect their peers and their broader communities. They're encouraged to take the active role of upstander and build positive, supportive online communities. They'll learn how to cultivate empathy, compassion, and courage to combat negative interactions online. And finally, we'll talk about news media and literacy. I think this pervades many of the classes that our students uh, take at Bear Creek. We'll, we'll take it, tackle it as a topic through our house mentor group discussions, but I know that it gets reinforced over and over again in other upper school and middle school classes in terms of learning to think critically about the news and media they encounter every day. Students, uh, as a part of this module, will demonstrate the ability to identify, evaluate, and use information effectively, find credible and trustworthy sources, and give proper credit They'll recognize how individuals in society are influenced by the media and the misrepresentations and stereotypes they sometimes promote. Students will reflect on their responsibilities and rights as creators in the online spaces where they consume, create, and share information. I know it's something I've been thinking more deeply about over the past um, couple of years in the news cycle and realizing how manipulated we are to be in our own news bubble through different social media platforms. And I think that's so important. Um, even I'm very interested in this, you know, how can we find truth in this time and in this age? So I'm looking, um, I, I'm looking hard at that. And then as a content creator, when I create this, um, when I create my own presentations and when I create content for students, am I honoring the people who, who designed, say, this light bulb on the slide? I need to, um, to think carefully about how I'm curating um, and using content. So important ideas for our students to have as well. Now, I want to show you. I'll start with the Common Sense Media website, and uh, I have an educator account. I want you to know that our educators at Bear Creek, at least in the middle and upper school, have all received training um, in, the, in this uh, digital citizenship curriculum. And there's this great tab for parents. So I, screen, I took a screenshot of this just so you could know what's here. It's really awesome. It's separated out by age. So if, if you have kids of a, a certain age, you can look at that. 
you can look at various topics like cell phones or social media. Um, and then there's a particular things about different apps. Like if, if you're interested in knowing like what's Fortnite all about or how does TikTok work? Um, these various things. Also how to set parental controls on various things. You can, one of the things that, that I loved it for back in the day when my kids were tweens and teens was being able to, they have the, the common sense media portion for movies and TVs. I can actually look up different TV shows or movies that maybe I don't have time to vet ahead of time um, and find out like, what, what are they going to see if they go, they go to this movie that's just come out or what, what is this TV show series really all about? And I found that very, very helpful. Um, now it's my children who vet movies for me. Oh, mom, you wouldn't, I don't think you'd like that movie. There's like too much violence in it for you. So once your kids um, get older and they're out of the house, that, that's the kind of thing you can expect. Um, it's great. Let me show you what other resources are. Oh, by the way, this Common Sense Media platform, everything here is free. You could also make an educator account, actually. Think of it as, um, as an opportunity to, um, to put your teacher hat on, parent teacher hat on, and you can see what we're, we're doing at Bear Creek, or you can use the resources for yourself. Uh, on our Bear Creek website, which you can get to whether you're a Bear Creek uh, a, a tender or parent or not, we have this great resource for parents that is chock full of all kinds of resources. I was talking about that um, interactive digital citizenship uh, training, and that's one of the first links here. You could use that yourself. You could you could see it if your child isn't in ninth grade yet. What's coming? Um, the common sense media curriculum is uh, also a link here you can click on. One of my favorites is a group called Access, access.org. And um, we have access, <laughs> access to access here on our platform, but also the Tools for Success curriculum has, or uh, program has been going for a while. And we have had many great speakers. Nathan Pettit has spoken um, before and we we leave a trail of resources so you know if you haven't seen some of these before check them out they're really great but i thought i'd take a minute to show you the a couple of the axis things the um the great thing here is axis has dozens and dozens of topics and i picked out three that i thought would were particularly pertinent internet filtering and monitoring is one a parent's guide to Snapchat or a parent's guide to smartphones. If you haven't um, given a younger, you know, maybe a tween a smartphone. So think about that. Um, what happens when you click on one of these is it opens up a PDF that might be 10 to 15 pages long with very, very practical things. So I thought I'd just show you what happens if you were to click on the um, uh, what the, that first uh, icon, the difference between the different internet things, the filters, the monitors, and the parental controls. So here's a definition. There are boatloads of other hyperlinks within the PDF. So talk about nitty gritty. Any of these are available. It does require, if you want to use the access um, materials, then you would have to be a member of the Bear Creek community. However, you can just join Axis if you want to anyway. I do want you to know um, it's a Christian organization and not only does it tackle these technology issues, but it, it tackles other tough parenting topics. So that might be something that you would be um, very helped by. So that's available. So I um, also have said before, you may want to know how to set up parental controls on Windows or any other device. Maybe you're a Mac, an Apple family. So there are definitely some good controls that you can set up. And you might find this article helpful. We'll, we'll include that for you when we send out the links through this PowerPoint. 
you'll receive that after um, attending here today. So a, a great tool, very much in the nitty gritty. Uh, these are the links that you'll get when this is sent out so that you have everything you need, hopefully, to, to um, have great parenting success with technology. And here's just a little bit more since you've, you've, you've lasted this long. So again, some of these are a repeat, but I think they're worth a second look. Consider some kind of a day. Call it Tech Talk Tuesday or whatever day you choose. But it, the better it is to start young so that it's not weird, it's just what our family does. But even if you haven't started that yet and you've got a senior, it's never too late um, to have some good conversations. You might want to consider the Common Sense Tech contract. There's some interesting things in there and um, some families have found it really helpful to use that in their home as a, as a guide to tech use. I think it's super important to decide where tech is going to live at your house um, during the day and night. That can be really helpful um, with starting younger and thinking that through just makes it a thing we do at our house and it doesn't it doesn't feel weird. But again, if things are seem like they're they're in chaos a little bit at your house, that, that might be something that could be really great. Consider tech-free zones and days. I know a family that decided none of its members would use tech on a certain evening each week, and they're loving that. I think that's dependent on the age of your, your students, where you go with that. Nathan mentioned it, um, but certainly uh, not unreasonable at all to, to have Meal times be tech free zones. Um, and then we have to model good behavior as parents. Teens loathe hip hypocrisy. So parenting is really hard work on a lot of levels. You can get phone usage reports and um, take a look at how much time is spent on apps. That, those would be great conversations for a, a tech time check in. And you can also set limits on how much time you spend on certain apps. So I hope some of these things helped you. When I think of nitty gritty, I think of a, a pan of um, grit from a gold miner. And I hope you found a gold nugget or two in this presentation. Honestly, just start with one or two ideas that make sense for your situation because Rome wasn't built in a day. So a lot of good can happen from just one or two simple changes. Keep up the good work you're doing as parents. And um, I invite you to continue on with the admissions uh, link that Katie put in the chat um, to hear more about Bear Creek. And I, I thank you for uh, coming today. So I hope you'll choose a gold nugget uh, for your own. If you wanna put in the chat something that you're gonna share, that'd be great. And otherwise um, head off to the meeting that, that Katie's clicked into the chat. Thanks. <laughs>